and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I am so very glad that you clicked on this video today and as you can see we're on part two. So we're going to be finishing the book club by Lauren D. Eastelman tonight. I really hope that you guys enjoyed part one of this little ASMR sleepy time bedtime reading. It really made me so happy to make this for you guys. I hope that my voice is comforting enough and the story is interesting enough. And I really, really hope that you guys felt relaxed and you enjoyed this reading. I really appreciate all the views, the likes, the comments. I absolutely appreciate it so very much. I don't even think you know how much it means to me. Each of you individually special, making my channel feel like home. So let's dive straight into where we left off on The Biblio Mystery Book Club by Lauren D. Eastelman. Looks like we left off on page 16. So we'll start right there. So grab your blankie, adjust your pillow, maybe even a warm cup of tea, and I'm going to read to you the ending to the book club. Are you ready? I'll wait. Just let me know. Okay, all set? Perfect. Let's dive right in. I can't believe it. I can't sleep nights thinking I'll be murdered in my bed. Don't concern yourself, Bertie, said Uncle Ned. It ain't as, as if everybody in town ain't dreamt about it as long as they knew you. Carl Lathrop used his gavel. That's enough of that, Ned. Miss Flat has the floor. She ought to take a mop to it now and again. I've been stepping in the same wad of Billy Fred Mustard's gum since I voted last. Billy Fred, chewing gum in the back row of chairs in a crowded town hall, shook his head. That's a lie, you old coot. Lincoln's been dead since before gum was invented. Pipe down, both of you. Bertie gave her girdle a mighty tug. We used to have a nice safe town to raise our children in. The last week alone, a murder's rate gone up a hundred percent. That's because last week it was zero, Chief Dougherty pointed out. He stood near the door with his thumbs hooked inside his sand brown belt, his belly pushing out around them. Lathrop pointed the gavel his way. Since you feel like talking, Chief, maybe you should bring this up to date on the progress of your investigation. Mr. Sharecross and me, and I, corrected Neil Boone, principal of the elementary school and a substitute English teacher. Well, Mr. Boone and I, didn't know. You was putting your heads together when I wasn't present. Dougherty grinned. Mr. Sharecross and I are expecting an express package from CBC headquarters in New York City sometime today. The program's director is sending us a DVD of that TV pilot that they shot of Mr. Fister's library back in March. With any luck, it'll tell us what book the killer stole. And what good will that do? I'd like to know, asked Bertie. While I'm at it, what's the purpose of inviting a shopkeeper into a homicide investigation? My nephew Roy, the Eagle Scout, she started. She stared around the room over the tops of her half glasses while the title sank in. Has a badge in tracking and would seem to me 
the more appropriate choice. This incident being apparently beyond the talents of the police force, we all pay taxes to support. Doherty untucked one of his thumbs to rest a hand on his sidearm. Not that he had any intention of blowing Bertie flat out from under her Dolly Parton wig. Apart from his background, which we all seem to keep forgetting, Mr. Sharecross knows books. Once we've established which book Mr. Fisher was killed for, he'll be able to narrow down the suspects to the collectors who specialize in that particular area. Even if the killer wasn't one of them, they'd be the ones he'd approach to sell the item. I'll be talking to them all. I hope you're right, Chief. Gordon Tolliver, publisher of The Good Advisor, rose to his considerable height. I'd like to feature some good news for a change, something more diverting than Sherm McDonoughue's quest for pre-Columbian Indian, Indian arrowheads as opposed to pre-Columbian European arrowheads, put in Neil Boone, who taught American history in a pinch. Go ahead, make fun, Sherman McDonoughue left off plucking cockleburrs from his socks to address the congregation. I've got an offer of a thousand bucks from the Smithsonian for a Clovis point I found on the superstition overlook. Lathrop wrapped the podium. We're drifting away from the reason for this gathering. Where is Avery Sharecross? Oh, he's busy, Dougherty said. Nobody ever accused Avery of laziness and sloth. Busy doing what? Pressed the head of the council, shifting through clues, analyzing evidence, interrogating suspects. The citizens of good advice have a right to know how their trust is being invested. The chief returned his thumb to his belt, shifted his weight, from one foot to another. I can't answer for him right this minute, but when I talked to him this morning, he was rearranging his inventory according to the Dewey Decimal System, whatever that is. There! Sharecross gripped Andy Barlow's shoulder, making the deputy chief wince. He had a much more flesh in that area than a bookseller had in his whole body, which Chief Dougherty could lose from the middle without noticing. Andy hit pause. The picture on the computer monitor in Doherty's office froze. Can you zoom in? Sharecross asked. Sure. Andy played the adagio on the keys. The shelf in question filled the screen. We lucked out there. Andy reached back to knead his bruised flesh. Not all of the TV networks have gone over to Blu-ray. Ten years ago, this would have been on videotape, and good luck identifying the printing on the spine from Miss O'Leary's cow. Sharecross shushed him, sliding back his thick spectacles down to the tip of his long nose, back up to the bridge, and back down halfway, like a Chinese cleric manipulating beads on a buscus. At length, he straightened, returning them to their customary place. Something? Chief Dougherty was a patient man, but he and the bookseller seemed to live in parallel universes where the value of time fluctuated like foreign currency. El exploration de descombrimentos in Nuevo Espanol. Gentlemen, I'm dumbfounded. Me too, Dougherty said. I don't know if you're speaking Latin or Swahili. Castalian Spanish, in which I assure you I am no expert. Roughly translated, it's the exploration of discoveries in New Spain, published, if memory serves, in Madrid in 1545. Dougherty whistled. Anything that's old got to be worth something. Not necessarily. Age is not a factor in evaluating a book. If it were, every ancient family Bible in North America would be worth thousands no one ever throws them away, so they're common as clothespins. Nor is rarity, although this particular item certainly qualifies. I doubt more than ten copies were ever issued. Handset in wooden type for the court of Philip II of Spain. Condition is often a factor, but not in this case. Missing its covers and even significant pages from the text would hardly affect its value. Demand, gentlemen. 
That thing that drives capitalism tips the balance in its circumstance. I know of 10 billionaires who would bid eagerly against one another to lay hold of the lay exploration in any condition. And from what I see here, this copy is complete, as close to pristine as you're ever likely to find it. This is a murder investigation, not meeting your book club. Come to the point, this side, of when they invented gunpowder. Actually, conquistadors were well equipped in that. Avery, sorry if I were the murdering kind, I would certainly give it a proper consideration in this case. The book was written by Hernando Cortez, conqueror of Mexico, considering the paucity of copies and the stature of individuals to whom it was presented. It's more than likely Cortez delivered them in person. He would have held this book in his hands. Darkly slid his cestin on the back of his balding head. I don't see it myself, but I understand. Give me a list of those folks and I'm on the way. I'll get right on it. Vern Plant knows his way around the computer at the library. He can goggle. Google, Andy corrected. He can Google the title and find out who most interested. This could also be your career, Chief. The suspect must have access to millions of cash. I like my career as it is. Nice town, decent wages, four acres I can grow sunflowers and entertain my grandchildren when we have them. Be a nicer place with one less murderer in it. You're a good man, Chief. You sell him this book? I wish I had. I could have retired if I hadn't already from the police department. He must have found it on the net, despite his distrust of it, or on one of his buying trips. I'm surprised he didn't share the discovery with me. Half the fun of collecting is rubbing other collectors' noses in your best acquisitions. Maybe he just got it, which may narrow the field further to others who were interested in the same time. How about the autopsy? Busted skull, extensive brain damage, death close to instant, as I guessed it ever comes. Doc Simmons has the Latin for the record. Leather fibers in the cavity left by a weapon, most like if Fisher was wearing a leather cap at the time. It hasn't turned up. I doubt Lloyd owned anything as casual as a cap. His taste ran to three-piece suits and freshly blocked felt fedora sap. I hate to think it. It means the killer came prepared and never put it aside. Lloyd was the same as a carpenter's level, but he'd do anything to guard his collection, including fight to the death, including that love is the strongest motive of all. Well, it's a big book and he was killed in broad daylight. Maybe somebody saw whoever was lugging it away. It's almost a thousand pages, each of them thick with parchment. It would be heavy as well. Those clasps are solid iron to reinforce the biting. Thick horizontal ridges at the top and bottom of the spine of the books on screen. If he left on foot, he'd be one tired man or woman, if she's built for it, by the time he got to where he was going. Perhaps someone saw somebody who looked worn out so early in the day. Could be. Andy took pictures of the driveway, but only tread marks there belong to the Fisher's Land Rover, which is still in the garage. If it were a sneak thief, he wouldn't want to advertise his coming with the sound of a motor. If it was a sneak thief, Shercross said, call it an odd cop's hunch, but I've got a sinking feeling it was someone we know. Deputy Chief Barlow rapped on the frame of Dockery's door which had remained open as long as he had an office. He got a ping on that door to door, Barlow said. Gordon to Oliver saw something. Dougherty dumped his half-eaten Big Mac back into the sack and wiped his hands. Go ahead, Andy, keep me in suspense. I'm just a guy who fights the council for your annual pay raise. I was wondering who to thank for that extra dime an hour. If you let me finish, I would have told you he's waiting outside. Prod him in. I don't know why you'd even had this conversation. To Oliver entered, ducking his head from an instinct. 
The top of the doorway gave him two inches clearance, but it was a tall doorway. At a half-century point, he looked in good shape, no extra fat, and a fine head of brown hair. I didn't think anything of it until Andy told me that you were looking for a man who looked tired and might have been carrying a large object, he said to Oliver, folding himself into the captain's chair. I was taking down last week's front page from the window, a small town newspaper tradition, chief. The point is to tease people into paying to read the stuff. You jump to an inside page. I wondered about that. It always seemed to me the opposite, plastering your wares out in full sight for free. No danger of that, chief. Ever since I left my old newspaper job, it's been my dream to publish my own. It's a challenge, especially today. With the internet and all, I struggle to keep myself in paper and ink. Dougherty nodded sympathy, resisting the urge to strangle the rest of the story out of him. You had to be a diplomat in good advice, where you kept running into the same people day after day. Tell me what you told Andy. I just peeled off the tape when I saw a man hurrying past the window. He was red and panting, as if he had rung a long way, and he was carrying something under one arm. What was it? I didn't see. It was on the side opposite the window. Anything else? A sap? What's a sap? A blackjack. But not that necessarily. Some kind of blunt object that might be used to crack open a man's skull. I saw nothing like that. Sure? Someone running around town swinging a bludgeon would leave an impression, don't you think? You'd be surprised what folks don't notice. They can't all be eagle-eyed journalists. Recognize him? I'd never seen him before, and I like to think I know everyone in town. It's part of my job. Know him again? I think so. Officer Floyd Debner, a part-timer, had studied art at the University of New Mexico. He listened to To Oliver's description and sketched a rat-faced man with bulging eyes, his mouth hanging open to show a set of teeth. Only an orthodontist could love. Dougherty had copies made for distribution. He showed A.V. Sherikos the original. The bookseller climbed down from the wobbly step ladder to accept the drawing. His corduroy jacket was smeared with sooty dust. He'd been reorganizing the shop for a week, but the chief couldn't see that he'd made a dent in the chaos. The story checks, Dougherty said. As Shercross studied the sketch, the newspapers halfway between Fisher's house and the bus station. The killer wouldn't hang around the town a minute longer than he had to. That's logical. The man would attract notice. He slid his glasses back to the bridge of his nose. Does he look familiar? He does, but I'll be gone darn if I can place him. Was it at the Gaiety Theater, possibly? Why the Gaiety? Orville Potts, the manager, has a weakness for crime bills. Many of them feature Steve Buscemi. He snatched back the picture and stared. Albie, have you heard back on fingerprints? Got the results from the state police lab this morning. I'm glad we took yours. I was able to eliminate those and a couple other sets belonging to the folks who knew Fisher well enough to visit. We're working on the rest. You dusted the library ladder. First thing, seeing how high up the book was shelved, all we got was fissures, gloves. They leave marks too, not that they're unique like fingerprints, he shook his head. And he didn't wipe it down either, nor we wouldn't have found blisters. Sherkos looked at the wall calendar featuring the cartoon caterpillar wearing spectacles. He might have been peering into the mirror. This is Wednesday, isn't it? Comes around every week about this time. Why? The good advice comes out today. I think I'll go down and buy a copy. Why? You'll just be full of this case with that picture on the front page. You won't learn anything there you don't already know. I agree. The rodent features he had just been looking at stared at him through the tall window besides the door to the newspaper office on the ground floor of a false front building as old as statehood. Publisher identifies killer. Read the headlines on the front page, taped to the plate glass. 
Avery, what brings the owl out of his barn? The publisher got up from his desk to shake the visitor's hand. He towered over the bookseller. The quest for information. An experienced journalist like yourself shouldn't find that unusual. And you know more than most. Didn't you mention once that you wrote a book column before you came here? The El El Paso Times. The feature was discontinued. I was told there wasn't enough readers interested in books. Does it sound oxymoronic? Stupid, more appropriate. Did you ever visit Lloyd Fisher's mansion? Quite recently, he was kind enough to grant me an interview about his TV appearance. Tragically, he was killed before I could run the article. Have you ever been fingerprinted? Odd question. As a matter of fact, no, I haven't. I wasn't in the military and I don't own a firearm. I'm happy to say I've never been arrested. Well, never's a long time. It eliminates one of the sets of prints the police couldn't identify. Did you discuss Fister's collection? Am I a suspect? I don't have the authority to judge, but I am helping out Chief Doherty. I'm interviewing everyone who had contact with Fisher just before his death. I see. Yes, he did show me some of his prize acquisitions. Was one of them El Exploration de Scrumbinmiento in Nuevo Espanol? I couldn't say offhand. He had some Spanish titles, but I don't understand the language. It may be in your notes. Don't trouble yourself to look for them. It's a large book bound in Morocco leather with iron clasps on the spine. You'd remember it if he showed it to you, I'm sure. It does ring a bell. It's missing. The police are operating on this area it was stolen. That would explain why I didn't see it. Perhaps he sold it. Doubtful. Lloyd spent his life building that collection. He wouldn't be likely to break it up. How tall are you, Gordon? That's a rather personal question. And yet, not an unusual one for you, I imagine. You stand out in the crowd. I'm six foot seven. As tall as that? No wonder Fisher's prints were the only marks on the ladder in his library. You wouldn't even have to stand on the tiptoe to take down the book. The publisher stiffened, adding to his height, Please leave. I won't have my character assassinated in a building I pay rent on. One of your many expenses. They must have been on your mind when he showed you the latest addition to his library. The book being so old and rare, naturally, he wouldn't let you handle it, but being familiar with the book trade, you knew it was valuable. The nearest telephone was downstairs. Perhaps it rang and he went down to answer it, leaving you alone in the room. Whatever the interruption was, it wasn't long enough for you to stash the book, or you could retrieve it on your way out. Did you hear him coming and duck behind the door? I'm warning you, Sherkos, I'll throw you out. Violence would be an option for, in your case, it was when you panicked and struck Fister on the back of the head with the book you were holding. Okay, Tawalava reached out, gathering the bookseller's lapels in both fists and lifted him off his feet. Put him down, the voice of Chief Darkerty. He stood in the doorway with his feet spread and his revolver clasped in both hands. The barrel pointed at the publisher's sternum. Tawalava hesitated. All intention went out from him then. He lowered Sherkos to the floor. Dear me, Sherkos brushed at his wrinkled lapels. Hands on your head, to Oliver. No need for that, said the bookseller. He doesn't own a gun. I think he told the truth about that. His weapon of choice is the very thing he committed murder to own. Dougherty shook his head and laid Sherkos's signed statement on his desk. I never heard anything like it. The stolen property doubling as a weapon in a homicide. It was pure impulse. Had he been thinking, he wouldn't have risked damaging it. It's tragic, but fortunate for posterity that those clasps were harder than Lloyd's head. He nodded toward the evidence on the desk, the volume as big as a hefty dictionary clamped in iron. How do you know Tualiver wasn't lying about the stranger? It was a hunch, I said. He lacked imagination. People who look for symbols in books like Garp often do. Or he'd have come up with a description that didn't belong to a well-known actor. The unused ladder started me thinking the thief had to be tall enough to reach the shelf nine feet from the floor. 
He might have gotten away with it if he weren't so interested in throwing us off the track. Not really. The only other copy of L Exploration known to exist is in the Library of Congress. He couldn't try to sell Fisters without implicating himself. No imagination and too volatile for reason. He'll cure him of that in prison. Meanwhile, what do we do with the books? Sherikos looked uneasy. It mustn't languish in non-climate controlled evidence room through the trial and inevitable appeals. I keep my rare stock in a property maintained storage room in Santa Fe. I'm offering it to the justice system indefinitely without charge. You're a civilian. That would constitute ownership. No judge would allow it. Sherikos's face fell. Dougherty stood. Get up. Raise your right hand. Whatever for? I'm swearing you in as an officer with the Good Advice Police Department and putting you in charge of the homicide evidence. The bookseller rose with a smile. All of it? Every last volume. All right, friends. So that is the end. I think it was quite cheeky and really interesting. As you can see, it looks like the actual person who is supposed to showcase the story, the publisher, and let you know what was happening during the investigation was the very person leading them off track and ultimately the murder of this unfortunate, unfortunate tragedy. I really hope that you guys enjoyed this reading of this biblical mystery. It made me so very happy to read it to you, and I hope you enjoy. Let me know down in the comments if you enjoy this, and if you're looking forward to Vlogmas 2022, where I'll be reading the Harry Potter series each night for you guys. So, without further ado, I will catch you all in my next video. I hope you have sweet dreams, and good night.